Thanks everyone online for joining us and joining our talk. I hope you're all comfortable at home. And um, in this talk, Richard and I will be talking about a smart contract utility framework, which we developed at Gnosis, that allows you to extend your smart contracts um, after they've been deployed to allow other applications or other smart contracts to basically read the state that your original smart contract um, stores on chain. And uh, I'm Felix. I'm a software engineer on Gnosis Protocol, which is a decentralized exchange protocol we're developing at Gnosis. And with me today is Richard, who is the tech lead on the Gnosis Safe, our uh, multi-signature wallet. Let's start with, uh, let's, let me start by introducing kind of the problem that we have uh, seen in the past when we developed smart contracts at Gnosis. May it be the Gnosis Safe or our prediction market framework. Um, or our decentralized exchange. In all these projects, we kind of um, found it pretty hard to decide and know all the view function requirements that our smart contracts would have in the future at design time. Basically thinking about all possible ways that um, front ends, clients, other smart contracts might want to access and operate in our state uh, turned out to be quite challenging. And it's not only um, in, in Gnosis products, we can, we can see that kind of um, a lot of complex DeFi applications have to really like at design time think what are, what are all the view requirements that we have. Um, on the right, we see the compound uh, controller, com controller interface, which is kind of how the uh, core compound smart contract can be accessed. Um, and yeah, that just to give you an example from the decentralized exchange that I've been working on, we were trying to um, let people fetch the order book. And for that, we built uh, a paginated kind of view function where you can fetch orders uh, page by page. And we even thought about um, making it filterable by user, but we didn't foresee all the ways that people would eventually want to um, slice and dice this information, for example, by sell token or by buy token, by um, the amount of time that an order was, was valid for. And so, yeah, we basically ended up with a smart contract that didn't incorporate all the view function requirements that we had. Um, and we also didn't use a proxy uh, contract because we didn't want anything to be mutable. We wanted it to be a pure uh, immutable contract state. So it made it really hard to, to interact with it um, in the long run. You might say that for smaller or simpler smart contracts this is not actually a, a big issue because Solidity kind of exposes getter functions for most of your state. Um, automatically. So if you just write a simple smart contract with public variables, then most of your state will actually be accessible via auto-generated getter functions. However, this is not true for private variables, and private variables um, exist in real-world contracts for, um, like, you might, you might say, well, there's no real reason to use a private variable because uh, the storage in the contract itself is, is visible to the to the full node and thus readable for, for people. So um, you, there's no really real good reason to declare your variable private. But we see smart contracts in the wild where, uh, con where variables are declared private because maybe you want an inheriting contract to not access it directly, but rather have that inheriting contract go via a getter function that does some sanity checks beforehand uh, or other kind of uh, well privacy related reasons. Another example where Solidity doesn't generate a comprehensive kind of getter setup for you on your smart contract is when you're using complex data structures uh, such as structs. So here's an example from the 0x contract where their order information consists out of three fields. And so if you store a list of order infos or just an order info on your smart contract, Solidity is not able to create an automatic getter for you. And as I said earlier, there was this concrete example um, from our exchange where, where we didn't kind of foresee all the view function requirements. And so what we found ourselves ending up with uh, from time to time is having a contract that is deployed on mainnet where the storage that we want to access is not easily accessible. Now, if you find yourself in this situation uh, with a contract that you have already de deployed, there's two workarounds that you can use um, today. The first one is to use RPC, standard RPC call get storage at, which takes the address of your contract that you want to read from and a position within that contract's storage uh, where you want to read one word, so 256 bits from. Now, 
The problem with this is that uh, this works over RPC, but over RPC only. So your front end might be able to use it and your unit tests might be able to use it. But if you have another smart contract that wants to access your original protocol, um, it cannot use the get storage app method. So it can, for example, not have access to a private variable or some field uh, in a vector that, that you want to read with this, with this method. The second downside is that computing the storage position is quite cumbersome. It requires you to know how Solidity actually does um, storage layout um, when, when it compiles. And if you want to only read, let's say, a Boolean flag or maybe a 32-bit value from your word, from your 256 word, it also requires some uh, some bit magic, so it's really not convenient to use. And then the third downside is that it's quite slow because you can only read one word at a time. So if you, for example, wanted to read the content of a vector, you would have to use many consecutive get storage at calls, which takes a lot of time and can potentially also overload your node. The second workaround that you have today is to use a non-standard um, RPC feature, which is offered by geth clients and that is called the state override flag that you can path with any eth call rpc invocation um, so basically there you have this extra field state override and you can pass kind of a fake evm bytecode that geth will simulate at the storage address of your original smart contract and that allows you to deploy any kind of um, external extra view functionality that you wish you could uh, redeclare variables you could do whatever you want um, Geth would then pretend as if your fake EVM bytecode is at that address and then execute your call. The problem again here is that it's not available to other smart contracts. Um, so you really can only use this via RPC. And you're making yourself very dependent on the node setup. So we, you really need a Geth node um, as, as, your, as your endpoint. You cannot use Bizu or Open Ethereum. Uh, which makes it kind of not really decentralized or usable by kind of any client. And then also the distribution, well, first of all, the creation, but also the distribution of your simulated bytecode is quite cumbersome uh, because, well, you have to share it to every uh, customer, to every client that wants to use this extra feature. And it's not really, um, yeah, it's not really a convenient standardized way of making um, this, this extension or extra code that you wrote available. So what we're advocating here is a solution that we built um, at Gnosis, a small, multi well a, a small base class basically that uh, you and your devs should or we, we encourage you and your devs to use this this as a um, as a base class uh, this class is called storage accessible and it basically gives you access to the storage of your dapp even after your original smart contract has been deployed and using it is as easy as just making your dapp inherit from storage accessible. Of course, this requires some foresight at uh, design or at deployment time. So uh, you cannot just use any smart contract that has already been deployed in the past and use this. You really need to make a proactive design decision when you're building a new dApp. But if you're doing that, um, this base class gives you two main uh, advantages. The first one is it exposes uh, the get storage add functionality that we've discussed in the workarounds as the uh, standard RPC call, but it makes it native to your smart contract. So this get storage add is actually exposed as part of this base storage accessible class. And so it allows other smart contracts to also access storage of your smart contract at any arbitrary point. Of course, if you have a legitimate reason to keep your um, storage private to other smart contracts, you shouldn't be using this functionality. But for most cases, there's not really a good a good reason to have private variables, and uh, you would much rather, or you're more likely to find yourself in a position where you have some storage that you would uh, like to read, but you cannot. The second advantage of this um, get storage at implementation is that it not only takes the offset, it also takes a length. So it can read more than just one word consecutively in an atomic call, which makes it much more efficient to read larger areas of memory, for example, the content of an array. And so kind of this would still be your, or this would be your most convenient bet to just do a one-off read of a certain storage location because it doesn't require any um, EVM bytecode compilation or any Solidity compilation or deployment of any external contracts. It ships with your contract, it can be used directly. And so if you just really want to read um, you know, consecutive storage or a small, small value, um, it is the most convenient way to, to do that. 
um, slightly more involved and more powerful way is that by inheriting from storage accessible, you can actually add reader extensions to your smart contract after deployment. And how this works is that this base class storage accessible also exposes a simulate call function, which takes as an argument the address of some reader extension. And so while your original smart contract and the inheritance kind of hierarchy there has been set up at deployment time, you can later on deploy any reader extension that you want um, on the blockchain and pass that address into the simulate call at runtime. So um, your original con smart contract can exist and the reader extension can come later. And what storage accessible does, it, it invokes a delegate call on that reader extension. And there we become, we get a little bit uh, technical if, if you're not super familiar with um, how delicate calls and solidity works. Um, the main thing to take away is that this reader extension uh, basically invokes its code in the context of the original smart contract. So that reader extension has access to the internal storage of the original smart contract and therefore can implement, can implement any logic, any simulation logic that you want on top of the original smart contract. Uh, so the thing on the left is deployed when you deploy your smart contract, and the thing on the right can be deployed later on. The advantages here are, again, that uh, it makes this feature, which is very similar to what we saw with state overwrite and, uh, and geth in the workaround section, it makes this available to other smart contracts as well. So simulate call can be invoked both from an RPC um, interface as well as from other smart contracts. And it allows you to kind of uh, more easily deploy and share your extension code um, with other clients because you can just use a truffle to to build this reader extension deploy it on mainnet for example and then just share this address and tell people okay here's my reader extension just use this it also allows you to keep your original smart contract quite uh, concise and focus on the most important part of your protocol or of your application and maybe expose the most important uh, view functions, but you don't have to think about every possible way that future integrations uh, want to access your data. You can just allow these people to, or these apps to deploy their own reader extensions. And then the last thing that's kind of cool uh, with the way that uh, the concrete implementation works is that these reader extensions are not only limited to executing view methods or static methods, they can actually simulate writes on the original smart contract storage. So can they, they can simulate mutations um, on the state. And of course, none of these mutations are actually going to persist. Um, this delegate call itself is wrapped into an inner call that gets reverted. So uh, all changes to the original smart contract change will get reverted by the time that the simulation finish finishes. But it allows you to do things like um, flipping a bit or pretending you have some maybe some more balance or some less balance or something like that, and then invoke a verification function or something and return that simulation result back up. So you're not just uh, limited to uh, executing view methods, but you can also do simulations on the smart contract state. But really, the, the, the high level or the main takeaway here is the orange box can deploy can be deployed very long after the original smart contract has been deployed. And so you kind of are very flexible in defining your, your, your reading necessities later on. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Richard, who is going to talk about how we use storage accessible or how we're planning to use storage accessible in the new version of the Gnosis Safe. Thank you, Felix, for the nice introduction, the theoretical introduction. But yeah, let's let's take a look how Already, these also these cases that Felix were describing are influencing us and actually made us come up with a solution. So, a very first or simple example for the Get Storage Ad is actually that in one of the recent versions, um, we added a new feature to the. Um, can you go to the next slide, Felix? Thanks. So, so, we added a new feature to the safe where we wanted to add a fallback handler. So, a fallback handler. Basically, it just defines an address which is called whenever a method on the contract is called that is not implemented on the contract, and then it's forwarded to that other method. Um, since the uh, safe is using a proxy pattern and we added the storage variable later on, we said, okay, let's define a storage slot where we store this. So I, I outlined how this will look um, in the storage layout. So in our first slot, we normally have the master copy, and to avoid that we override anything existing, we said, okay, let's take basically a random slot based on a um, Keka cache 
and store the address of the fallback handler there. So what we did not do is we actually, there, we didn't provide any way to read this value because um, at the point of writing, the safe contract was already so big that it was impossible, like we could not compile it anymore. We couldn't deploy it anymore since it would, would, he, uh, would be beyond the size limit. So at the earlier stages of chain, this was only possible. You could use the get storage as, as Felix described earlier, but now since for the next version, we decided just in case something like this happens again, we will use our storage accessible library. And then we can even use on chain the get storage add defines a storage slot, which is like, this is something that it's easy to provide to the contract as it is a constant. And then you say how much like an address is stored in one slot. So we read this one slot and can then use this address stored in the slot. But as I said, this is a very basic example. This is like the, the fallback if you if we cannot do it better. So let's take a look at the more advanced example, our reader contracts or how Felix calls them the extension contracts, right? So one of the conditions for these reader contracts is they actually need to know about the storage layout. So they don't need to have the same values inside the storage, but they need to know where is what value um, so to be able to access this. So what we can see in the, uh, you don't see my mouse. So what we see in the Gnosis safe state reader contract, you can see that it inherits from um, all the different contracts um, that actually contain the storage layouts of the safe. So there's a master copy storage, which stores this the address where the logic is stored. We have the module manager, which stores a linked list of modules. The owner manager, also a linked list of owners and a threshold. And then the Gnosis safe storage is like the data for the EIP 712 verification and the nonce of the safe. So now that this reader contract actually knows the storage layout, we can implement any method that actually evaluates or like access the storage layout. So one simple example would be implementing an is owner function, which looks up into the linked list if an owner is present there. Or we could also implement a get owners function to return the whole linked list um, to make it accessible. So if we now look at this, how this looks off chain in, in our contracts, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so we can see that we can use our reader contract, then say a call on our Gnosis save, so this, um, the storage access method called similar delegate call where we say okay use this reader contract and call this method which in this case what guess uh, was get owners and then the response that we get we can use the abi decode uh, library like in this case we used web3 but esas.js provides similar functionality and can decode this data to actually use this in our javascript but this is something we could have done before with a little bit different measures, but the really nice part is now we can do exactly the same also on-chain, right? So if we uh, define a contract, we can actually call the simulate delegate call method, use the reader. Here in this case, we say our safe actually provides the address for our default reader. And then we encode the method that we want to code, uh, call on the reader. And then using this ABI functionality that is provided by the Solidity language, we can decode the return value. What we can see here is also that actually one of the ways that the Gnosis Safe wants to improve the usage of the storage accessible library is that we provide a library contract. And on this library contract, we will uh, implement most of these very common methods that um, then can be routed through the contract accessible uh, storage accessible contract. Um, and in this case, make it very easy for third-party developers or external developers to actually, and for ourselves obviously, to use these methods. So if we then have, have a, our own contract, like if a developer is developing their own contract that wants to check these values, it becomes very easy and they can just uh, make use of this using Gnosis Safe Reader for the Gnosis Safe. And then they can directly call the method on this Gnosis Safe and this uh, as it would be the native method. So here we can see, we just call save.checkOwner, which performs under the hood the is owner check and returns an a Boolean. So all this is, uh, is still nice, right? We could probably do the same with some getters and it's nice to add more getters, but the really nice part is actually what Felix said in the end is like we can run simulations and can actually sh check out how is the contract behaving if we change state and get a result back. So. This for the safe was actually very important because on the safe, we need to execute a transaction. And this 
this, this internal transaction, we also assign something like a gas limit. But to estimate what this gas limit should be, we need the approval from all the owners. But if all the owners give us approval to estimate this transaction, we could also just execute it and then perform the transaction before it's estimated and the users actually know um, if they really want to execute it. So this is a little bit of a hen egg problem because we need the signatures to get this value, but to really get the signatures, we need this value, right? So what we did in the end was on the safe, we, it's kind of like the, the like the pre version of what we did with the storage accessible. We like, we simulate the call by calling the execute method of the safe, calculate how much gas it uses, then wraps this inside a, a revert message and returns us back out of the contract. So if we now look at it, how we looked, uh, how we use this in JavaScript is that we actually need to encode this call, uh, like this, this ABI call into the, like encode the data, put this into a call, perform this call. Since this is reverted, we then have to analyze the revert message. So this is done where we do the substring starting at 138, because it's the stuff before it is defined by solidity as the length and the type of the error. And then we try to pass the number there. So what we did not think about, which just on later on when we started, like when when more people started to use the safe, is actually that um, in Gnosis, we most of our nodes that we run for all the our internal nodes are guest nodes, and this. Uh, guess returned for the most of the versions, the error string as a normal response. So there's no special error message and no special error response type, but a lot of other nodes actually return the data a little bit different. So this algorithm some, uh, suddenly doesn't work anymore and we would have to adjust it to all the nodes. So now the contract is already deployed. We cannot change it anymore. All the users would have to update independently their saves because there's no central updating algorithm for the saves. So this is uh, something where this really bites us in the ass. So now with um, with a new contract, it becomes a lot easier. So if we look at the storage accessible contract, we can just implement a simple estimate gas method where we do basically the same as before, but instead of having to wrap this result into, um, into a revert message, we can just directly return it. So one thing to note here is this, these first two lines of the method, which it's like a guard value. This is very specific to the safe. It's not really specific to the storage accessible library. And this is because the safe allows to execute delegate calls. And again, with a delegate call, it's theoretically possible to load logic that destroys the contract. So we need to make sure that this cannot happen. And this is the first two lines, uh, make sure of this. But yeah, now that we can easily estimate how much gas it takes and return it, it becomes a lot easier to use this um, also off chain because as we have seen before, we can now, oops, I don't see the image, no. So now we can use from before, we just use simulate delegate call or if it's implemented on the reader or in the test library, you can call it more directly from there, but we define the reader, encode the estimate gas and just have two value data and um, the operation and then return it. And then we have uh, can use ABI decode to very simply decode this. And even better, since as Felix said before, this is now not only possible off chain, we can actually do exactly the same on chain and can make use of this to, um, to also look on chain and estimate transaction on chain or simulate state changes on chain. So obviously there are some limitations or some, some things to pay attention to when using this. So while it's nice that your original contract, you can limit the state, you might not have to implement all of the view methods that you, that might be possible. You still have uh, the additional deployment cost because you need to deploy this reader contracts, which inherit some of the storage layout. So they are, they have a, uh, they, there are some costs involved for that too. Also, you still, even so, you don't have to think about all the potential um, getter methods that you need to implement. You have to have the insights to say, oh, there is this awesome library by Gnosis written by Felix, which can help me at um, ex, um, at, at view logic later on. So it's still something where you need to know ahead of time, it's make some considerations. Also at runtime, this increases the um, gas cost, how you access the uh, 
the storage, like the, how you read the variables. Since in a normal case, you can just go to the contract, you have direct access to the storage layout and can return it. But with the reader contracts, actually you might have some indirections, loading more states from the different contracts, executing more logic. So this um, has a small impact on the runtime cost. Also, as you have seen, there is some complexity involved in the um, in coding these reader contracts. But as you, as we mentioned before, for example, for the safe, we want to provide this reader contract, and then it is as simple as defining a using in the contract on the contract level to make um, to have the same behavior as before. So, since th this is a trade-off, we. Um, since this is, so the trade-off, as you can see, we would still um, recommend that even while using the library, that you still implement the getters for your most important variables and most important states, so that they can still be accessed without the library. But using the library to make sure that even in the future, your contract is bulletproof against any future use cases and access. Um, yeah. Obviously, the Gnosis Safe is a very complex example, and there it's a lot of code. It's hard to really grasp where the advantages are and how to play around with this. So um, there's a very nice, a little bit smaller example repository um, by Felix, where you can see how this works out and how this plays together, and uh, also can see how this can be used on contract level and how this can be used on JavaScript level in your tests. Yeah, this would be all from us. And uh, thank you for listening to us. Let us know if this is usable, uh, like useful for you, and if you want to use it, or if it can help you, if you're missing something. And yeah, happy coding. <laughs> there was one question from uh, Ben. Uh, the new later functions can only be read only, correct? Uh, so, no, I think um, that is one of the cool features. The, the functions themselves can be can, can simulate writes. Uh, none of the writes will actually take effect. Like these extensions don't have uh, the power to actually change the state beyond just their simulation. But if, as Richard showed, for example, you wanted to um, uh, fake some, 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 some storage write and then basically check what are the gas costs or would my verify function go through, uh, you can do that. Cool, let me check out this link. Any other questions? Uh, let me just scroll up and see if there was something that I missed. Yes, so the, yeah, this lets future contracts access it, not just available externally. That's correct. Um, yeah, if you have any other questions, um, you can also uh, shoot us a message at felix at gnosis.io or richard at gnosis.io. These are our emails. Um, of course, this is an open source repo, so if you have any feature requests or ideas of how we can make it better, more efficient, more customizable, we uh, are more than happy to see pull requests as well, or just um, also issues opened. And um, with that, yeah, thank you very much. And have a good rest of the conference. And uh, thanks for organizing to the, to the Truffle team. Bye-bye. Good evening. Bye-bye.